Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me on the podcast today again is the dementia nurse, Gail Weatherwill, which I still think I got that wrong, but that's okay. Let's just get started. We're going to be talking (laughs) about finding moments of joy. Hello again, Gail. What's going on? It's been crazy. I'll take that back. Don't (laughs) answer that. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Don't ask if you don't want to (laughs) know. That is very true. My dad always used to say, what is this? Dumb question quiz time? (laughs) I could come up with a few of those. Yeah. So we're going to talk about moments of joy today, which I think a lot of people could be using. Now, normally we're talking about it in relation to people caring for somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia, but I bet you there's going to be some crossover today. That's a fact. That (laughs) is a fact. Um, You know, when you, when you say uh, finding, talking about finding moments of joy, I just have this vision of the um, uh, downtrodden caregiver thinking, yeah, right. Moments of joy. If you say that one more time, I'm going to have to throat punch you because there ain't <laughs> no joy in my world right now. Um, so I, I think more the focus is going to be on communicating with our loved ones when language fails us so that we can find those moments of connection. And those moments of connection are what every caregiver longs for, and that is what gives us joy. So that's how we arrived at the joy. We're not going to be talking about, you know, hiring a bouncing house for your backyard and pony rides and all those other exciting things. Um, We're going to be really looking at the practical ways of... um, sustaining yourself as you go through here and it is possible there are moments of connection um to be had and those are the moments of joy that i'm referring to okay well i am game as most people know my mom is in advanced alzheimer's and there isn't a lot of connecting it takes a lot Mm -hmm. of work and even then not always successful and then since gail and i talked last time which is about a week and a half ago my mom has fallen and broken her leg which may or may not have accelerated her decline it's a little hard to tell at this point so it's been a week and a half between covid virus and mom falling and life (laughs) yeah well that's my motto if it's not one thing it's 50 so you know Yeah, so I'm sure most caregivers feel that way, too. Exactly. Exactly. So, oh, pardon me. I touched my face. That's Um, okay. You can wash your hands after you were done. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (sighs) Okay. So, how do we go about connecting with somebody when language is pretty much gone? My mom's still chatty. Right. Right. None of it makes a lot of sense. Right. It's not comprehensible. And what it mostly requires is a change in our own mindset. We are used to communicating with language. Hello. Since we were, you know, in the crib and somebody's hanging over you going, say, mama, say, dada. So, I mean, this is ingrained in us from the very get go. Um, so to switch from language, especially with somebody that's still talking, you know, it's nonsensical to us, but, you know, there are some mumble words in there, here and there, and, and our instinct is, okay, let me try to figure this out. What is she actually trying to say? Um, which is a recipe for making both yourself and your loved one crazy uh, because there is no rhyme or reason. Um, all of the brain centers that language comes from, um, and there are lots of parts of the brain involved. There's the part that formulates a thought, there's the part that sends the impulses to your vocal cords. It's 
it's a complex process. So when people are attempting to talk and it's all jumbled up, it's we're not going to be able to decode it. There is no decoding. Well, I can attest to that. Mom speaks actual words. Mm -hmm. And for someone who isn't familiar with her, many times they'll look at me for clarification. Like, what exactly <laughs> is she talking about? You know, like one day she was talking about the quote, quote, unquote, the boys. Okay, well, my mom has two daughters. There were no quote boys. She does have two brothers. So I'm like, okay, I think she's talking about her brother. So I tried to go down that path. And then, I don't know, she took a left turn somewhere. Yeah. And I have found, and it, it took too long probably, but I have found when I scrunch up my face in contemplation trying to figure out like, what part of history is she talking about, she picks up on my, it's not even a frustration. It's more like, I, I guess I'm trying so hard that she yeah, just. It's a low grade anxiety because you want to get it right. And she picks up on that and then gets pissy. <laughs> yeah. Then they shut down. It's like, yeah, man. Which is, you know, part of the secret to finding those moments of joy and connection are becoming acutely aware that our loved ones are acutely aware of every nonverbal in the book. Um, I compare it to, you know, what we've always been taught when people lose their sight. Um, they developed a hyperacute hearing. Mm -hmm. When people with dementia lose the ability to communicate and to receive communication through language, they develop a hyperacute sensitivity to nonverbal cues. Yep, I've experienced that. That is a biggie. When I when I go to um, facilities and teach staff, you know, one of the biggies that I talk to them about is if you go in that room in a rush, I can guarantee you they're going to shut down. What, I mean, it won't even take two minutes because they sense that. So even if you are like, oh, my God, and, you know, it's the same thing in home. When we're sitting there going, oh, my God, the doctor's appointment is at one, and she took forever to eat lunch, and now we're going to be late, and I got to hurry up here. Oh, they pick up on that. So it becomes an acting gig. And I tell people, you've got to act as if you have all the time in the world. And, you know, as you notice, my voice dropped, my pace of speech slowed down, and I'm breathing, which is always a good thing. This is um, true. So one of the keys to connecting with our loved ones is controlling our nonverbal communication. Um, facial expressions are huge, very huge. Are you smiling? Are you scowling? Are you, you know, what, what's going on with your face? That's a big, big biggie. And then, of course, you know, how are you standing? Are you standing over them? Are you there with your hands on your hips? you know, trying to prevent your hands from wrapping around their tiny little throat. Um, <laughs> you know, you do what you got to do. Um, just keeping it real here. That is so, true. <laughs> and, yeah. So it's, um, we have to become hyper acutely aware of our own physical presentation, you know, how we're standing, how we have our arms hanging or doing or whatever, and what our face looks like. Because, and obviously, our tone of voice, the volume of our voice, um, and the the speed of our speech. Slower is better. I find with mom, I almost have to put space between 
almost each word because if I, even if I speak slower, Mm -hmm. which this, this pace is usually okay, not always, Uh but if I speak almost at a normal pace, I get, huh? And then sometimes if, if she catches me off guard with that kind of rude tone of voice question, which it doesn't always happen, then, you know, now all of a sudden I got to make sure my face isn't doing something bad. <laughs> it's an acquired skill. Oh, it really nope. is. That is for sure. And I learned that, you know, like I'd, I'd be thinking, I'd be like listening and thinking I had, I did a video. I, I do post videos of some of our encounters as a way of teaching people what advanced Alzheimer's looks like. And this one gal said, you make me so sad because it, you, you look like you're so angry with your mother. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I watched the video with no sound with, okay, I look mm-hmm. angry to this person. And I watched it three times. I'm like, I, per, I think she was hypersensitive because all I, my mom couldn't see my face. I was uh-huh. basically making faces at the camera. <laughs> but it, it was kind of like, she's blah, 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 talking, talk, words, words, words. And I'm like, huh? And yeah. then I rolled my eyes. But she couldn't see me because we were sitting side by side. Yeah. But then I thought, I did that one day. I like, it was just like scrunching up my face. Like, what is she trying to say? What are, like, give me like a historical marker or like anything. Because it, <laughs> it was like a pinball. Yeah. Just bing, 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 bing. I could mm-hmm. not figure out and after you know five minutes of the oh uh uh-huh oh yeah that sounds interesting oh yeah that's right Uh, you know then i'm brain dead of of boredom but i i watched her one day i i was thinking like what is she saying and i said you know oh i i didn't quite understand that she got so irritated with me so now i don't make the face (laughs) i just smile and progress jennifer Well, it's only taken 20 years, but well, it's a, I'll tell you, man, it's a, it's a learning curve. That's for darn sure. But, uh, well, as soon as yeah, you got it those, figured out, they go and change on you. I'm telling you. And I'm glad you mentioned that you had videotaped some of it because one of the best ways to, is ex- to know what your face is doing because once again, that is an innate part of us. Um, to watch ourselves like you did with the sound turned off and say, oh, oh, you know. But um, what I find is that if I am consciously focused on relaxing my face, you know, being, and that goes back to really being mindful being right in this minute because when my brain is going okay well hopefully she's going to do okay at the doctor's office if she does then we can stop at the store for just a few minutes but if she doesn't and what am i going to fix for supper if she doesn't and in the meantime our our face has like taken off on its own you know and and is doing its own thing so it's uh yeah it's it's learning about being sensitive to ourselves, which is not something that we're generally used to. Um, there have been several studies that have shown that when both caregivers and people in the early stages of dementia were trained in mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, by our good friend John Cabot Zinn, and you can find those courses online. That when people were trained, which basically that um, skill, and it is a skill, focuses on being in the right now and paying attention to what you see, feel, hear in this moment as opposed to where we usually are, which is, you know, several shakes into the future. Yeah, um, it's like all over the place. (laughs) But it was really interesting because there were several studies done. And what they found was 
even when the person with the dementia was in relatively early stages um, and went through the training, even as their cognitive status declined, as a group, they still had fewer problems with uh, behavioral issues. And definitely the caregivers had a lower rate of depression and which, you know, which was the chicken or the egg, you know, they were calmer. So their loved one was calmer or their loved one was calmer. So they were calmer. But, you know, I, I always encourage any caregiver, wherever you are along that road to look into mindfulness based stress reduction you don't have to you know buy into the whole thing nobody's you know gonna bring you a little buddha to sit out in your yard and you know well, sit fun. in front of and go um yeah um. well it's funny you say that because this week which is today is march 18th 2020 so the episode that came out yesterday was on mindfulness and even though I'm not, I mean, I'm in Northern California, you know, I'm not <laughs> one of those. Clear. Yeah. I'm not that far from Berkeley. So, Hey, I was just going to say you are at, eight. I'm at my ground zero for the woo woo people. Um, but I, I, I have never been able to meditate and I posted that episode. I, cause I'm not always, it, they're not usually that close to when we actually record. Cause I'm, I always record ahead, you know, uh -huh. case of emergencies like mom going to the hospital or the whole world okay. shutting down. Go so figure. he, he was giving me tips and my mom had been in the hospital for about two and a half days and I was walking across the house and I could just feel myself. It was, I was just winding myself up. Yeah. How am I supposed to make this decision? And, blah, 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 and yee, you could just like feel yep. the spring was winding tighter and tighter. Yep. And I said, stop. And I said, okay. And, and the way he suggested doing it was to say, you know, embrace the feeling and, and greet it. So I'm like, okay, hello, anger. Why are you angry? And all of a sudden it was like the light went on and it was like, it's because I am trying to do the best I can for my mom. I'm like, oh, hey, now I feel pretty good about myself. Literally yeah. in like that amount of time, yeah. it was so, yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. that's cool. So yeah, and that's more the focus, you know, just picking up little hints like that. It's not that, you know, you've got to have this big practice of meditating, but it's, you know, learning about ways to kind of short circuit the hamster wheel <laughs> when, it, when it gets going. Um, one of the things that I really like um, that someone taught was, when I'm like stressing or I'm in a bed, whatever, I can stop, sit down, close my eyes, and with the understanding that I'm not going to open them again until I have heard six distinct sounds. Hmm. And cars on the road don't count. And when I first heard that, I was like, yeah, well, a little hoo-ha. So, but I tried it. I'm not averse to exploration. And it works. I mean, you don't think about it, but when you stop and you close your eyes and you're sitting there and you're like, okay, well, the refrigerator just came on. I heard that. And, you know, the house is settling, so I just heard a creak and... I can hear the cat in the bathroom scratching the cat litter. And what it does is it takes your mind away from whatever you were flipping about because it's hard to come up with six different sounds that you're hearing. So you're concentrating on that so much that it has broken that chain. And it's, it, you described it perfectly. Once you interrupt that thought process, then it's like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, we can we can move back into sanity now. Um, we may not stay there all that long, but then we can do this again. <laughs> and it that's helped. the beauty of it. 
Yeah, it helped so much. I mean, I was just, I was literally standing by the coffee table going, holy crap. Like, I went from about ready to just melt down, which, you mm -hmm. know, would have slopped over into how I treated the spouse. And, yeah. you know, yeah. he doesn't need that crap either. <laughs> so it was just like, wow, this is almost miraculous. And I'm going to try the six sounds the yeah. next time. Give it um, a go and see what happens. And that, you know, one of the things that I really emphasize with caregivers is that, you know, when a loved one's diagnosed with dementia, we want to learn all about the illness and the medications and the, the you know, the testing, the diagnosis and blah, blah, blah. Well, the bottom line is medical science really has very little to offer us at this point in time. Um, a lot of people are working very hard to change that, and hopefully that'll happen sooner rather than later. But what we know is that focusing on the emotional issues and developing resilience, which is what I, you know, when I think about those little you know, those little measures that we can use to stop the hamster wheel, that's part of resilience, you know? You can, you can interrupt your stress level. Learning about those things is gonna do a lot more for your loved one than you spending hours poring over the latest scientific reports. It really is. So, you know, I say to people, have you looked into studying how to take care of yourself as aggressively as you have looked into learning about brain disease? I bet you that answer is no most of the time. No, it's not because that's not what we're, you know, we got this whole huge, you know, the great American healthcare system, um, <laughs> which is run by gods whether God knows it or not. <laughs> and, you know, they're quick to remind us that's who's running the whole thing. So, you know, we have all these great expectations and it's, uh, I'm like, well, let's go with reality at least for a few minutes. Um, so looking into these other, you know, measures to, to sustain ourselves and, Talk about throat punching. The term self-care is another one of those that'll trigger. <laughs> Don't ever tell a dementia caregiver, be sure to take care of yourself now. And it's like, eh. Yeah. You got to give examples. Well, right? it's like when people say that, I just want to say, oh, great. Now, what afternoon next week are you going to be able to come over and stay with my loved one for three hours so I can do that? Because, you know, I think you're really right. I really do need to take care of myself. And, um, yeah, that usually short, short circuits that pretty quickly. But, um, but Still whether it's, you know, the term or whatever, and it's not really the term we're responding to, it's the indifference of society and the people around us to what we're going through that, you know, trips our trigger when somebody says something like that. Because in reality, we are ignored and society is, unless somebody's lived through it themselves, have no clue. I'm not sure how I got on that so much, but. <laughs> Well, I think that's one of the reasons that I, well, it is one of the reasons that I do some of the videos and it, you know, and I try to, I try not to be too brutal about them because, you know, they are videos of my mom. So I, you know, yeah. she'd murder me if she knew what I'd put online <laughs> with her. Whoo, I'd be dead multiple times over. But people think, oh, well, it's just, you know, they forget who you are. They forget the, yeah, they forget how to use the toilet. Not, yeah. you know, not that they're incontinent, but like a month ago, my mom's, you know, I take her out or I did. And I would say, she said, well, I have to go to the bathroom. Okay. So I open the door and walk into the public bathroom of where she lives. And we get in there and she's like, why am I in here? Oh, yeah. 
And I'm like, oh, okay. And I said, oh, you said, you know, of course, they got to be chipper about it. Oh, you said you had to go to the bathroom. So I came in here so <laughs> you could use the bathroom and I'm going to wash my hands. I'd like to find I, I an like excuse. I like the paint scheme in here. I thought I'd pop in. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's a great place to record a podcast in this echoey <laughs> tiled walled room, right? <laughs> and I said, and I, so I reminded her that she needed to use the toilet. Oh, I do? And I'm like, yeah. are you kidding me? And I basically had to verbally walk her step by step in how to go to the bathroom. And the following yeah. week, I actually had to help her take off her pants. And people yeah. who listen regularly, and you should, they know that my, she's she's gotten very combative with help. So yeah. the whole time I'm pulling her pants down, and I'm glad she couldn't see my face, but the body language probably didn't help. I was a little afraid. I was afraid that she was going to smack me yeah. or claw yeah. me. Because that's what she does when she doesn't appreciate your help. She's upset. Yeah. So I guess, I don't know. I didn't upset her that day, but I was like, I'm not going to be doing this toilet routine too many times because, one, we pay a lot of money for where she lives, and I don't want to do it. And, two, I don't want to get abused. But you you said something that triggered a thought. You know, we have that mother-daughter relationship. And for whatever reason, now – Years ago, I was a much more negative person than I am now. I, I had a person that worked for us who was always commenting, like, oh, you're always complaining. Or, Why are you always I'm like, I just made a statement. It wasn't a complaint. And one day, he'd, you know, it's like a third time I'd heard it from him in a couple of days. And I was like, why is he hearing complaining? All I'm doing is stating a fact. So I thought, okay. Let me, let me like self assess here. And I did. And I really changed the way I quote unquote stated facts. So <laughs> I still Just don't think they were them like I see them sports fans. Yeah. That, you know, and I'm like, if he sees them that way, then obviously other people see them that way. So I was always the negative personality and my mm-hmm. mom and I got along fine, but I wasn't the favorite of the two most of the time, Yeah, which is interesting. So I'm thinking <laughs> that even though she doesn't remember me as her daughter, even the slightest possibly negative expression on my face just yeah. tr- like triggers something in her physically. Right. Um, never thought of that until we just had this wonderful chat. <laughs> well, marvelous. That's, you know, that is the thing. And when people say, if you've seen one person with dementia, you've seen one person with dementia. And a huge part of that is because you cannot completely separate from the brain that individual's life experiences and those relationships and those deep seated responses that they're not even aware of. And most of the time we're not aware of either. It's just, something this is just the way it's always been like you said there's you know some little tweak on your face that signals and that comes from a pattern from the past our brains are oh lord they love patterns they love patterns and by the time you know you get to 80 you've got a couple of patterns pretty well ingrained there and you know all the whatever in the world's not going to undo all of that. Um, because it's so interesting that now play into it. It does. She talks about her husband as if he's still alive. My dad's been gone mm-hmm. for three years, yeah. but she'll talk about it. And again, there's a lot of words and mm-hmm. some, it's like so frustrating. It's like follow the bouncing ball, but it's always like, well, she, I asked her a question the other day, which I know questions aren't always a good idea. <laughs> Um, I was getting a little desperate and well, I figured it was a, it it was a question that didn't really require any kind of answer. It was a social question. I'm like, so what are you guys up to? She asked me that a lot. And I, and I said, are you guys going on vacation? And she said, well, we have dinner and we do this and we do that. And, and then she launches into a bit, you know, we take care of the house. And I thought, no, he didn't because he did not feel if there was paint on the walls, we didn't need to change it, even though it hadn't been painted in a dozen years. And, you know, you do have to at least repaint for touching up and cleaning. Yeah. 
when when he died and we had to fix up their house it was like uh it was yeah. it was rough but it you know she's but she's talking about him not in really positive tones so it's really interesting <laughs> cuz i get a little frustrated cuz it's like can i can i get her off the chatting about her husband track because it's all negative and i really don't want to hear all this negative crap i i lived yeah. through it i don't need to hear it again yeah right. Yeah. So it's just interesting that, you know, it's like I can see how what's coming out of her mouth is based on deep seated feelings. So exactly. It doesn't exactly, exactly make me feel good when she told me to drop dead the other day. <laughs> it's she hard was to mad say. at me. Well, you know, that is, I really, I mean, I have such a heart. I just feel so bad when when caregivers are turning themselves inside out, upside down and purple, doing anything and everything they could possibly do for this person's well-being. And then it's like, you horrible bleep, 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 you're stealing me blind, you haven't fed me in weeks. and. <laughs> I'm fed up with you. I'm going to live with your brother, who's the one that, you know, lives a half a mile away and has it called in six months. Um, you know, and I had to chuckle earlier when you said something about you were never the favorite one between you and your sibling. And, but you were the one that was doing the caregiving. I'm like, you know, I, I think there's a pattern in that. I sense that, you know, with all the caregivers that I know, I, that's an interesting dynamic that somebody could study at some point in time. Um, well, I'm the oldest and I'm the healthcare DPOA. So there's yeah. some of that probably plays into it. Yeah. You know, my sister and I are not close at all. We see mm -hmm. the world 100% differently, which yeah. is fine. You know, there, I'm sure there's other people in the world I don't, you know, who see things entirely differently. And that's fine. It makes the world go round, but it doesn't work in a family too well. And, my, yeah. and she's very much the same personality as my mom. And for whatever yeah. reason, they either were best friends or mortal enemies. And most oh, yeah. of the time, they were best friends. Only two speeds. Yep. And I was just the other one. <laughs> Oh, what's her name? Yeah, like, oh, yeah, um, you. <laughs> yeah. It'd oh, well, there was right. a time my mom literally told me to my face, you make all your mistakes with your first one and you get it right with the second. And I remember thinking, oh, the second one. I'm not going to go live on the internet with the reasons that that was 100% wrong, but I was the easy one of the two of us. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I did not give them nearly as much trouble as my sister. So I'm trying to figure out how she got it right with the second one. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. So that's the dynamic that we have going back, yeah. you know, 53 years thereabouts. And yes. so it's, you know, it helps to keep that in mind because exactly. I do get very frustrated and I'm sure she senses it when, you know, it's like you said, I'm like, I am doing everything I can to give you a nice afternoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The least you could do. Just work with me here, yeah. okay? Um, yeah, don't tell yeah. me to drop dead. Don't claw me. <laughs> I don't ask for much here. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> I realize I just like she to has leave to... here with all of my skin intact. And apparently that's too much to ask. Um yeah, that's yeah, her. It's tough. And that is one of the things that people, you know, kind of forget about in in the day-to-day -day, uh endless activity is that you know, whatever patterns have been in there for decades, just because the brain goes mush, that doesn't mean that those patterns aren't still playing a role. Um in both parties thinking and responses. So um, we have to sort of keep that in mind. One of the things in my uh, big support group online that I see a lot is people will post something really negative about their parent, let's say. And 
all these people will jump in and say, oh, you know, I would never talk about my mother like that. She's always been there for me, this and that. And I'm like, how do you know that this person didn't get locked in a closet every weekend so mom could go out and go to the casino? How do you know they weren't verbally abused every day? I mean, we can't make assumptions about people's history together. Um, I get really jacked up when people start talking to spouses about, well, you made a vow in sickness and in health. Man, that, I mean, that they're not even talking to me, and that makes me want to punch somebody. <laughs> um, or my other favorite, well, she took care of you when you were a baby. Oh, I hate she that wiped, statement. She wiped your butt, and I'm like, uh, yeah, well, I hate to break it to you, but there's a little difference between wiping the behind of a 12-pound infant and a 200-pound angry, frustrated, not wanting to, you know, not understanding why anybody's helping or what's going on anyway. That's got, that, those two things have zero zip, not a. Uh, See, I'm glad probably. you say that because I feel the exact same way. You know, people say that, well, you know, it's my mother. She, she blah, blah, blah. The same thing you just said. And I'm like, there is a huge difference between raising a child who, for most of us, I realize this isn't 100%, but for most of us, we know they're going to go from this helpless blob of human mm -hmm. to, you know, like my daughter is 28 on her own, handling her own life. Doesn't come by as much as I'd like, which is <laughs> kind of a joke. It's fine. Um, you know, it's like I take a step back and go, we did a good job with her. Yeah. I don't get any of that with my mom. You know, it's like, no. first off, you're, you're chasing something down the drain. And, right. and she doesn't appreciate it. She's not going to get better. It's not right. going to get easier. You don't get a reprieve. Yeah. You can't call up the babysitter and say, hey, can you watch my mom for three or four hours while I go to the Broadway show or whatever, which of course you can't do right now because of the fire. <laughs> well, you know, so it's... That drives me bananas because I I don't yeah. yeah to me it's you're not comparing apples to apples at all there. no not at all not you know all. it would be all. different if you if you you were a special needs child and somehow managed to grow up and now have to take care of your parent that might right. be a little bit more similar but still obviously that's yeah. not really going to happen yeah. so it's it's a whole different dynamic. It's Do you find that spouse caregivers have a little bit less of this um, nonverbal miscommunication? Because I know some spouse Not caregivers. Oh, okay. I, I, I know one, uh -huh. he, and he knows that he's blessed. But, man, he and his wife have been – he was in a position to do things that made their life easier. And I just read his yeah. blog post today. They went out to lunch and dinner every day to uh -huh. one so that it didn't add to his chore list. His, yeah. his focus is doing what she needs. Now, obviously feeding her is part of that, but cooking takes time away from doing what he needs for her. Yeah. But yeah. obviously with, you know, restaurants closing to dine in, now yeah. this dynamic has changed, but she's been yeah. sweet and loving. And they've, just, you know, for nine years, they've been dealing with Alzheimer's and they've had a really easy path. And I thought, yeah. first off, they must have had a fantastic relationship before she was diagnosed. And somehow that part of her brain is just still there because she still, yeah. she tells him, I appreciate, you know, you have a heavy load and you take care of such good care of me. I'm like, if I heard that once a month from my mother, I'd be like, over the moon. Yeah. But it That's, ain't going to happen. You know, that, that is a great point. And the, the thing about brain illness is it affects everybody differently. And it's kind of the roll of the dice. Mm -hmm. I had um, a really close family friend who um, my kids grew up with them. We were like 
sisters, me and the woman and her mother-in-law lived with them and she developed dementia, but she was very pleasant. She was never, you know, throwing stuff and this and that and the other thing. Sometimes she'd be a little stubborn about doing or not doing this or that, but you know, all in all, it was a much easier road to hoe than, you know, the one whose father or whose husband is ready to knock their block off and there it does happen that people who were never like that who never in a million years would have raised their hand to someone and and they go through those changes so it's the thing i always go back to is that everybody's journey is unique it's based on a thousand different variables what were your relationships like in the past how you know how is the brain failure affecting your loved one's behavior right now and it's nobody has the same formula um kind of thing so it just you know it just makes it dangerous to assume that my experience is going to be like your experience or your experience is going to be like somebody else. It's all um, very individualized. I did want to take a few minutes to talk about the really more advanced stages of dementia and how we communicate there. Um, because I think even, you know, once our loved ones get into what we call word salad, where they're just kind of, you know, nothing really comprehensible. That sounds like the stage we're in. Yeah, it does happen. It does. Um, a lot of what I've observed and have sort of intuitively learned over the years comes from that whole idea of nonverbal communication. And one of the biggest, biggest keys is eye contact. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, something some poet said somewhere that the eyes are the windows to the soul. They are. People would, I would drive people crazy because somebody would be totally agitated and the staff couldn't do anything with them and, da, 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 and I'd come in. It would take me like two minutes to get them in a totally different headspace. And so much of that was due to shutting my mouth and using my face and my eyes. And that's hard to do. That is not instinctive. When we want to fix something, we feel like we need to be talking. And when asking someone questions. Is, yeah, yeah. Like, what is this about? Well, they can't understand the damn question, and they don't know why you don't just get on with fixing whatever's wrong. And then it does become like an infant where you go, okay, is she hungry? Is she wet? Is she, you know, this and this and this trying to decide because, you know, the big, the bit, my big motto is all behavior has meaning. So, you know, people don't go off the rails for no good reasons. They're troubled about something and they can't use the normal methods to communicate that to you. But the more you talk, the more confusing it becomes for them and you know so i do an awful lot of just getting down at eye level making eye contact when i worked at the nursing home i loved it because there was a crew of ladies that always hung out there in the lounge near the nurses station and when I would come in in the morning, I always came in with a huge smile and ready for something wild and exciting to happen. <laughs> and I would, you know, I would immediately go one to one to one to one to one, looking them straight in the eyes. And those ladies had no idea who I was. They couldn't, I mean, you know, they may have been living there for five years and seen me every day for the last five years, but they couldn't tell you who I was. But they knew by the expression on my face and the eye contact we are used to eye contact how do you communicate with an infant 
You ask them 15 questions and get frustrated when they don't answer. <laughs> oh, go figure. It's true. And when that brain goes back to that more primal function, you know, you look in a baby's eyes and, and something happens there. There's some kind of transmission that happens there. And that's what we do with these loved ones. Those ladies, when I would walk in and look each one of them, they didn't know who I was, but they knew something good was happening. They, it was, um, I had a friend, Jane Kieran, who wrote the Mitford books, and um, one of her books was called uh, Somewhere Good with Somebody, no, Somewhere Safe with Someone Good. And that was the feeling these ladies would get. They didn't know where they were, but they knew it was somewhere good and they were with someone who was safe. And that's what we try to communicate. You're safe. You're here. We're not hurried. There's no threat here. Because anxiety is the mainstay of so many of the behaviors that trouble us in people with brain failure um the other thing that really influences me with thinking about communicating through the face and the eyes i worked in intensive care for 17 years before i went into long-term care and over that amount of time you're with a whole lot of people when they're on their way out of this world and let me tell you, if I didn't believe in, you know, that there's more going on around us than we see and recognize and understand, being with so many people when they had one foot here and one foot wherever, um, you know, by about the 15th time, you feel a sudden draft of air that shouldn't have been there. By the you know, the 20th time you see this patient talking to whoever they see up there in the corner um, where you see the, the person that should, by all rights, have been gone days ago, hang on until the serviceman from Germany, their grandson, finally gets there, and then they release themselves. I mean, all of these things together just really impressed on me that we have to move past this commitment to language and the obvious to communicate one of the things that you'll hear repeated over and over again is that even when somebody's in a coma they can still hear what's going on around them and we i mean there's a thousand studies that you know, verify people who should have been dead and then they come back from the brink and they can tell you exactly what was said and so on. So, you know, your hospice nurse says, well, go ahead and still talk to them because they can hear it. Well, one of the things that, that I truly believe, because I've seen it a hundred times, is that you don't necessarily need to use words out loud for that. And what I liken it to is prayer or meditation when you know whatever your belief system is it's we're not going to get you know there's not going to be jim baker walking in here in a minute so everybody <laughs> stay calm um sorry I had to do that whatever your beliefs are most people go with the idea that there's something bigger than ourselves within yeah. the universe and the idea of praying or you know connecting with the universe with a capital u we don't do that out loud for the most part when people pray most of the time it's a silent conversation whether it's one way or two way what I really try and get caregivers to consider is the thought that you can communicate with your loved one in the same way. You can communicate heart to heart. You can sit quietly 
with someone, look them in the eyes, and just grab two minutes, one minute, 90 seconds of we have just shut out the rest of the world. It's just you and me right here. Just you and me right here. Everything else is gone. It's just you and me right here, right now in this moment. And you can speak those things from your heart. You don't need to say them out loud. In fact, you probably should not say them out loud because then your loved one's gonna be sitting there scrambling with their brain to try and figure out what it is you're saying. But I have no doubt in, in God's green earth whatsoever, and I've been a nurse for 40 years, that we can communicate without words. I believe that a hundred percent. I've a, I've been a dog owner or owned by yes. dogs for my entire life, and they yes. they sense when you're upset. They sense when you're well. The thing that cracks me up the most is every morning have breakfast. As soon as I get up, they're on high alert, and if I walk, <laughs> she's on the move. It's like if I walk towards the bench with the basket with the tennis shoes in it. They even the 12 and a quarter year old who's got bad nerve arthritis in his back legs, they're literally bouncing up and down like kangaroos. Oh, goody, we're gonna go yeah. for a walk. I'm like, these are my right. bike shoes, it's okay. I'm gonna, it's Wednesday, I'm going for a bike ride. Not today, it was raining. Um, right. but it's like there's certain things that it's like, even if it's not a hundred percent the same pattern, they know, okay, she's done eating breakfast, that means there's exercise coming. Are we gonna be part of it just cracks me up. It's like, you know, it, you can, and you don't even have to walk towards the shoes. You might walk towards the closet, but they're like, whoop, now she's getting the socks. That's before the, it's like, how do they know this stuff? I mean, yeah. I know dogs aren't dumb, but Lord, they're just. No. But you know, our loved ones are, you know, they, they sense these things and we sense these things with each other. One of the things I used to tell families all the time in the ICU when they're, you know, do I have time to go home and take a shower and come back or is mom going to die while I'm gone and I won't have been there or whatever. And I would always tell people, you know, you don't have to physically be here in this room to share this experience. Because as people become less and less dependent on their body, less and less dependent on their brain, because they can't depend on their brain anymore, they, they become more of a spirit. Their spirit or their soul, their essence, if you will, comes more to the forefront. And so I would tell people, you know, you might want to be here if this is, you know, if you don't feel like you can do that, then, you know, go down and sit on the pier where the two of you used to go fishing on Saturdays or wherever that, you know, what we tend to lose sight of because we're just so committed to our work you know, day-to-day -day lives that are controlled by time, space, and language. There is another level, and there's another level of communication. It makes me really sad when I hear caregivers say, there's a stranger living in my house. That's not my mom, or that's not my husband. Um, the reality is that individual is no longer able to project themselves onto the world in the way that you're used to. That's a good way of looking at it. Yes. They are no longer able to present themselves in ways that we're used to understanding. But the brain isn't the end all and be all of who we are it's an organ it has a function 
And yes, because our minds and everything else are tied into that, it's hard to separate it out. But the truth is, our spirits, which is where, you know, and okay, we'll call it our hearts. Our hearts are where we feel love and connection and meaning. So it doesn't matter how diseased your brain is. That doesn't affect your heart. Your heart is still in there. And one of the things I'd like to say to caregivers over and over again is they can't communicate to you in the way you're used to them communicating with you. That does not mean they don't still have the same feelings. Having feelings and communicating feelings are two different things. They're no longer able to communicate those feelings about you. That has nothing to do with whether they still have those feelings. Why would we think that someone who, you know, has spent their whole life caring about us, you know, been married to somebody for 50 years, why would we think that brain illness would change their heart toward us? It can't. It changes what they can and cannot communicate. It doesn't change their heart. And when people stop and let the world fall away, and it's just you and me, eye to eye here, for just this one minute, when you stop and everything else is quieted down, you can hear their heart and they can hear your heart. But you have to tune into that. And that takes practice. But, you know, my, my thing always is what the brain can't remember, the heart can never forget. That is very true. And that is, I mean, I, had, I use that as a slogan in my teaching. What the brain cannot remember, the heart can never forget. And what I tell caregivers is, she can't communicate it to you anymore. But the reality is, she's in there. She knows you. She loves you. She has a sense of how much of your heart you're pouring into trying to help her and she loves you all the more for it she just can't communicate that and when i talk about finding moments of joy that's what i'm talking about those moments when your hearts connect may not happen every day probably won't happen every day but they can be, those moments can be cultivated and sought out where you get quiet, you let everything fall away, and, um, you know, the eyes really are the windows to the soul. And you can look in those eyes, let go of what's going on, and, and you'll see something that'll, that you need to see. I really believe that. Well, I'm not going to argue. <laughs> That's good, because I ain't got all day to convince <laughs> Sorry, we needed a little moment of levity there. <laughs> End on a chuckle, right? There well, that go. makes sense. When I sometimes I've come to visit mom and she's asleep, sitting in a chair, kind of nodding off. I don't want to startle her, so I, I, you know, I sit down next to her and I, I'll touch her knee or whatever gently. And as soon as I can tell that you know, like she's, oh, huh, what's going on? I make sure I'm smiling. That way, the yeah. first thing she sees is this face that she recognizes, and it's yes. smiling, and it's not because you know, somebody startles you awake. That's negative yeah. anyway. Yeah. I want to make sure to suck all that energy out and yeah. just smile and nod and smile. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to try now that I have a feeling that we're not going to be walking around the complex or going to parks and look watching. Yeah. As I say looking yeah. at kids. That sounds creepier than we <laughs> we do. Yeah. Watching the children play, 
Um, I mean, I'm hoping that I can be able to transfer to a wheelchair and we can do that, but right now it's questionable. So I will make sure to, you know, look her right in the eye and just give her as long as I can, because that's really out of our norm. Yeah. But give her that time and just think positive thoughts. Yes, exactly. Send that good kernel, however you want to, you know, phrase it. Um, just the connection is the important thing. Because those are the moments that sustain us. That is true. Yeah. I think people are learning how much we need socialization and connection now that, you know, yeah. Yeah, so many of us. Being denied. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to get an education here. So. Well, my mom always said, everything happens for a reason. And there's times I've been like, uh, well, could you explain the reason for the Alzheimer's or falling and breaking your leg or the whole world is on shutdown because of a pandemic? Yeah. Can you explain those to me? I'm, yeah. I'm very curious to hear about that. But in, and it's kind of a good way to maybe end is instead of saying like, well, the whole world is shut down because of a pandemic or, you know, my mom broke her leg and it may have accelerated her decline there's still those little moments where it's like, Oh, well, people are learning to communicate. They're learning how important it is to socialize and slow down. So right. yeah, there's, there's always silver linings. I know that sounds cheesy, but you know, if we look for them, we will find them. And I say that on a day that's rainy and it'll be a little hard to find the silver lining because I think <laughs> it was supposed to stop raining. It doesn't look like it has. <laughs> I will have to go and maybe just watch the dog be Zen on the couch again. <laughs> That's a beautiful thing. Well, I really appreciate this. I, I enjoyed both of our conversations and hopefully we can connect again soon. You never know where I'll turn up next. <laughs> that sounds like a threat. <laughs> well, well, look at it either way. <laughs> Thanks a lot for having me, Jennifer. I really appreciate the chance to uh, share my ideas because I just, I really have a heart for what people are going through. And if something that I've learned through all these years of being around it can help one person, then today is a very good day. I agree. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.